I'm delighted to announce our next speaker, Dr. Brenda Jagathiesen. Dr. Jagathiesen is an internationally recognized scholar who's an associate professor in the Department of Educational Psychology, Learning Sciences, and Human Development at the University of Washington. Dr. Jagathiesen addresses national and global issues in her research on human-animal interactions. Her scholarship focuses on the dynamics of culture and childhood experiences in life settings and the traumatic impact of changes and continuities in family life, with a specific focus on the complexity of these issues in vulnerable children forming multiple meaning systems with animals. Dr. Jagathiesen is a member of numerous professional and scholarly communities and boards of governance including the I Ohio, where she is the Vice President of Development and Outreach. She's presently a fellow at the Institute for Human-Animal Connections, IHAC, at University of Denver. She's also a current editor of the journal, People and Animals, the International Journal of Research and Practice. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Brenda Jagathiesen. Good morning, everyone. I am Brenda Jagathiesen from the University of Washington in Seattle. Today, I will be speaking with you about human-animal relationships, forced separation, and psychological well-being. I would like to share a story about a child named Tomo in Singapore and my dog, Kush. Tomo was a student in my class, and Kush was my beloved golden retriever, the most friendliest dog that attracted the attention of many children. All of a sudden, one fine day, there was a knock on my door, and a teacher was, and a Japanese teacher was outside my classroom. He told me in Japanese, I brought you a new student to a class. He is from the higher level class, meaning he's from the gifted program, but he demoted to your class because of certain problems. And the problem he cited was that he does not talk in class. He does not partake in class. He's not interested in class. He does not interact with his classmates and he's quiet for the most part. On that grounds, they felt that he was not smart, he didn't deserve to be in the A-level class, and he was deported to my class, which was categorized C. There were three ranges of classes, A, B, and C, and I was in the lower end of the class. Tomo, his name, is his, was his name, and he came into my class. The first few days of my cl in, in class, he was very quiet, and I couldn't reach out to him. I found that the other kids didn't want to interact with him, and I tried to involve him in my class. It was, of, it was going very slowly, the progress. So at the same time at home, our house was being painted. And that particular day when the house was being painted, the date was finished. My husband and I talked about what are we going to do with our two golden retrievers who are going to be at home all day long while we are, while we are away at work with the intense smell of that freshly painted walls. So we decided my husband would take one of our dogs to his office and I would bring Kush. Kush is the name of the golden retriever that I brought to school. To school to class. I was not prepared for what was going to happen in, in school. When Kush came to school with me, I found the dynamics in the class changed. On one side, there were children screaming and yelling and ex so excited to see this fluffy, large golden retriever, and they were just ecstatic, but they were fearful of touching them, touching him, so they were jumping on their tables and from the top of the tables wanting to touch him and still not willing to come near him. So Kush had definitely made an impact on him. So what I did was during that time, I took the opportunity and I realized Tomo showed a bit of interest in the dog. And he seemed to be connected with the dog more than with classmates. So the next few, few days um, of the remaining of the week, I would ask Tomo to come to the front of the class and I'll say, Tomo, if you'd like to speak, you get a chance to pet Kush. And he volunteered to my surprise for the very first time after months of working with him. So he would come out to the front of the class with Kush by his side, his hand always, almost, almost always touched the head of my dog. And he would say a little bit that he could and dash back to school or dash back to a seat. So this went on for a few days or I would help ask him to help write something on the board for me. And I'll say Kush will be by the, by the blackboard and you can write, you know, you will have some support. And he would volunteer eagerly. On one particular occasion, during after a PTA meeting, his mother came and talked with me and I said, um, I noticed that Thomas constantly speaks about a dog in the class. And every time he speaks about the dog in this class, his eyes light up and he's very excited to share stories. And she said, I wonder whether I could 
ask you to help him academically after school hours because he's doing really poorly in his studies in the Japanese section as well. The first time uh, Tomo came to my house, of course, and he entered, Kush dashed to him, greeting him happily. And he was so afraid he sat in the seat and pulled his legs up. So over the next few weeks, he eased up. And one fine day, um, I had an appointment that day and I couldn't make, make for the class. And I called the mother and I canceled the class. But she didn't get the message and she dropped Tomo at home anyways. And I was out of home. My husband was at, was at home and he had no idea how to interact with the 10 year old. So he asked him to watch football with him on TV. He noticed during this time that Kush would come near Tomo and Tomo would touch him and cuddle him. And soon from the floor, Kush went to the sofa and from the, um, and then from a distance in the sofa, came towards Tomo and laid his head on Tomo's knee and they, and they became buddies. So the next time Tomo came, I uh, went inside the kitchen to get him something to eat. And I said, why don't you hang out with uh, Kush and keep him happy? And it just accidentally happened that I came to ask him if he wanted uh, some extra biscuits for him with, his, uh, with his milk. When I found him in the lawn, sitting next to the Kush and talking in Japanese to Kush about how Kush is the only one in the whole wild world who loves him no matter what his situation was. From the conversation, I found out that Tomo was having a horrible time in school. He was being bullied extensively. And also he was not interested in being in the classroom because the teacher did not notice it or did not call on him and ask him why he was feeling so sad. So he was being extremely bullied in school and he was having a miserable time in terms of um, social interactions with his, with his classmates and even his academic progress. So the other piece that I brought into it was I decided that since Tomo has interacted with Kush and Kush just adored him, I decided to bring Kush to class and demonstrate to the children how Kush as a dog loved Tomo I started to give Kush some, uh, Tomo some tasks. And I said, how many of you would like to know more about Kush, what he does in his daily life? Of course, Watashi, me, 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 they would scream and yell, I want to know, I want to know. Okay, so here's somebody who's going to introduce you to Kush, I said, and Tomo would introduce them to Kush. The fact that Tomo was able to talk about Kush and that Kush was so, um, so in love with him that he would look up to him and listen to every word. And Tomo had by now taught Kush some Japanese words, words to which Kush would respond, like move here or come here. And he was able to command Kush and come on and come on, I mean, instruct Kush and Kush would respond to him absolutely flabbergasted to the rest of the children. The fact that here was a child who they thought pure, uh, who they thought poorly about. And here was an animal that they adored and, was, and they were fascinated with, bringing them together, the most unfavorably viewed, that is Tomo, and the most favorably viewed, that is Kush, actually, actually changed the dynamics of how children viewed Tomo. Tomo went on to graduating with flying colors. He stayed in touch with me when he returned to Japan to join college. And, um, often wanted to share pictures, wanted me to share pictures with Kush right till the very end of Kush's life. The tragedy of forced separation between people and animals and its effect on human and animal well-being is yet to be well documented from a global perspective. Forced separation from an animal at a young age is something that I have experienced. Naturally, this issue is of grave importance to me. There is something about the very first time when as a child you experience loss and unexplainable heartache. For some reason, that loss and heartache stays with you well into adult years. Only this time you're able to make sense of it. I begin my presentation with my experience growing up as a child in India and of an extraordinary connection I had with one teeny tiny animal. The years that I spent as a child in my grandmother's home in southern India were special. Mango trees in abundance at her home were a treat for the squirrels who chased one another all day long. My grandmother often told me the story of why squirrels in India 
had three stripes down their back and why they were considered sacred in Hinduism. She taught me how to take care of those baby squirrels who had fallen out of their nest due to aggressive crows who would rock their nest to topple them over. Through her, I learned how to prepare a home for them made out of cardboard boxes using layers of newspaper and cotton as a soft bedding with twigs and dried leaves. She taught me how to feed them lukewarm milk using the tip end of a rolled cotton ball that had been dipped in milk and allowing the squirrels to suck on them. And then when the squirrels were strong and able to survive on their own, my grandmother and I would set them free on the mango trees. One of my favorite squirrel was one who was named Chini. He was expressive and had a unique way of communicating with me. He enjoyed snuggling in the cup of my palm and falling asleep. I felt the most happiest when Chini, during feeding time, would hold, would hold on to my fingers. He liked his milk always a little sweet. And that is how he got the name Chini, which in my mother tongue, Tamil, means sugar. I was always excited to come back home from school and spend time with him. Chini was becoming stronger by the day, and I knew soon it would, it would be time to let him go. That summer, my mother and my grandma made plans to go out of town for a couple of days. I pleaded with my mom repeatedly to allow me to stay at home instead of going to school and take care of Chini. Her answer in return was a firm no. She instead asked my aunt, who was visiting us, to feed Chini. Day one was tragic. My aunt was impatient and hurriedly gave Chini the milk and he choked and died later that day. When I found out about Chini after I came back from school, I began to cry uncontrollably, to which my aunt reacted saying, don't cry, silly girl, it's just a squirrel, and there are so many out there. Now, stop crying and I'll buy you a goat. They are actually more fun. To date, it is bittersweet for me each time I see an Asian three-striped squirrel when I visit my family in India each year. That childhood ache has stayed on. Migration in itself causes loss of connections between people and the animals, either on a temporary or permanent basis. Permanent loss of connections could be without any direct or indirect forms of contact with their animals. Temporary connections with animals often involve creative forms of establishing connections with their animals, often to the benefit of both human and animals. All in all, different kinds of migratory forms come with its own set of trauma for people and animals. In my studies, I have often found that children go through significant turmoil and grief at not being able to remain in touch with their companion animals. Other children demonstrated altru altruistic behavior towards their pets by sending them a special toy or a car to say that they miss their companion animal. In this slide, you will see two images drawn by Ali. Ali and her dog Wolf participated in my research study on children's relationship with their animals across cultures. Ali, a young Native American child, lived on the reservation. Her dog Wolf was her best friend. Ali had been displaced three times since the time her mother went into treatment and had to be away from home. Each time Ali moved to a home of a different family member, she was not allowed to bring her dog Wolf with her. When asked what made Ali happy, Ali chose to draw a picture of herself enjoying herself with her mother. When asked what made Wolf happy, she chose to draw a picture of Wolf in tears and wrote that Wolf cries when she leaves with her relative. Ali frequently voiced her concerns over the emotional well-being of her dog. 
Ali's case is an example of forced separation from wolf through involuntary migration or otherwise known as forced internal displacement. Internal in this case would be within local context. This is the case of Carlota, a Mexican-American child who lived in Seattle and her pet chicken, Chuck E. Cheese, who lived in Mexico. The two images showcase certain key issues related to her life. On the right side, the larger image with the green border showcases her life between two countries. On one half are pine trees, the American flag and cloudy skies indicating Seattle. And on the other half is a Mexican flag, sunny skies and a coconut tree indicating Mexico. The aircraft in the center reflects the fact that she is ferried between two countries. The smaller image with the orange border is her attempt to creatively create a passport for her chicken to be able to travel between two countries. Carlota's interaction with her pet chicken with, named Chuck E. Cheese needs to be understood in the context of her border crossing experiences. At the tender age of seven, she lived a transnational life and had already begun to experience the physical and emotional pains of separation between her parents and her pet chicken. She had already begun to characterize her life by the dilemmas of, pres of the presence of immigration authorities and documentation, borders, and the construction and reconstruction of realities tempered by the particular social and cultural settings to which she belonged to, belonged to from time to time. Her, her transnational life became a necessity because her parents lived in two separate countries, namely USA and Mexico. Her mother was an undocumented immigrant, her status rendering her unable to, the, to leave the US, and her father lived on his family's property in Mexico. Her paternal grandparents wanted to remain involved in her life, and so arrangements were made for her to return to Mexico to live with them during the winter and summer school holidays, which was approximately four months of the year at, at, the, far, at the farm of her, par of her grandparents. Carlota's pet chicken lived on the same farm as well. Citizenship status played an important role in Carlota's family life. Carlota's desire for family togetherness was brought into sharp focus when she was asked to think what makes her pet chicken happy. She responded by saying that Chuck E. Cheese preferred to be with all of his family members and that when me, my dad and my grandpa go up the stairs, Chuck E. Cheese follows us up the stairs as well. Grappling with the abstraction of national boundaries, Carlotta did not understand why her chicken and her mother could not meet. Her desire to bring her chicken back and forth between two homes prompted her to create a passport for her Chuck E. Cheese. With her father's help, Carlotta created a paper passport. She took digital photographs of Chuck E. Cheese from all angles and with the creation of this document, she attempted to imaginatively enable Chuck E. Cheese to travel between the two households and countries so that the whole family could be together. Her mother explained each time she came back to America, she would cry and cry and cry, saying that Chuck E. Cheese needs a passport so that he can travel between Mexico and America so that we can all be together. The harmful effects of war and terror on the lives of non-human animals remain largely undocumented for the most part. Often people have little time to prepare for themselves when fleeing their country and are unable to ensure that their companion animals can accompany them on what might be a harsh, treacherous and unknown journey. And so they then have to make the most difficult and heart-wrenching decision to leave their animals behind to fend for themselves. In this video, Aslan, a young refugee from, De from Damascus, the capital of Syria, is fleeing his country along with his dog. He has carefully prepared what he needs for his dog to travel with him, which includes a passport and a health document to take him to a safer destination. I, I love you, dog. I need 
in uh, working uh, uh, yeah, 500 kilometers. Yeah. Walking? Yeah, walking. With the dog? With the dog, yeah. Wait, my friend. <laughs> My name is Aslan in Doki Rose. <laughs> I Rose this school, yeah. They say you can check it though. Yeah, I have food and I have water, I have anything. Let's go. Goodbye, my friend. Goodbye. Good luck. Goodbye. Some people will ask. I ask you. You, you, you have only a small bag? Yeah, so and you bring your dog? Yeah. Why? <laughs> I, yeah, I love your dog. I say you love your dog. On March 11, 2011, a 9.0 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami struck the east coast of Japan. The tsunami caused the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster impacting many thousands of people and the animals. The radiation forced 80,000 to about 100,000 people to flee from affected areas. An extraordinary number of animals were left behind, some gravely impacted by radiation, sub-zero freezing temperatures, hypothermia and scarcity for A small Japanese town of Tomiyaka, which is located within the Fukushima's exclusion zone, had been completely abandoned. But now its resident, Naoto Matsumura, has returned. He is the lone standing man in this town right now, taking care of his own dogs and his neighbors and the remaining animals in the little town. When he returned to town, Naoto Matsumura said that he went over to check the different parts of his town and found many animals still tied up. People in the town left thinking it was just a temporary out-of-town stay and that they would eventually return back to their homes. Since then, he has decided to stay in the town and take care of all the animals in terms of providing for them food and water and shelter. On the screen in front of you, you will see a short bio of me and the different areas that I have studied. I am now an associate professor at the University of Washington, and primarily my work is on anthrozoology and animal assisted interventions and anything and everything related to the human animal bond and interactions. But follow your dreams, follow your passion. Don't do not let anyone or anything come in the way of what that what that voice inside you tells you should be a path that you should explore. Find anchors like Alan who came for me and stood up for me. Find advisors like my dean who will understand you and say, yes, explore. After all, this is your life. This is the life that you've chosen that you are planning to choose in your academic career or whatever career you choose. Do not enter a field that you are forced to because you will not enjoy it. When you take on a topic that you love and you believe in and you feel so strong about it, believe you me, Everything that you do in terms of research, teaching, and service in the field is a pure delight. I will stay up nights after nights to date. I do stay up nights after nights to date, even in my service-related work, because I am committed to it and I love what I'm doing. It's not a job anymore. It is just something you're so passionate about that you will give up your sleep to be able to do that. So the areas that I work in are connected to my background and my training. So I'm a linguist, social linguist. I speak six languages, um, not by training. Well, Japanese by training. I learned Japanese uh, to be able to talk and read and write, but the rest are because of being exposed in multilingual countries and family members speaking at any given time, speaking three, four languages at home. So find something that you are already not, you, you are already well versed in, you have a talent for, or you have a skill for, and connect it with this area that you want to explore. So for me, in my area, my childhood experiences, plus my 
experiences of teaching young children in several countries, particularly children who came from very distressful, vulnerable situations, was the main anchor for me in terms of, I wanna study this population. And then my love for animals, my absolute non-negotiable views and attitudes towards the welfare of animals, which I absolutely believe in, also was another component of, the, of, of my work and my passion. And then the last thing is that the ethics, the ethics of this work, we are involving humans and uh, children and animals, humans and animals, each one of them deserve a fair and equal attention in terms of their own individual well-being. Put together all three of these, I work right in the mecca of this three areas or this bunch of areas that I am passionate about. My message to you all is again, don't let go of your passion just because there are external factors that are stumbling blocks for you. You have every chance to be able to move them aside Find the right kind of people to support you academically. Find, find the right kind of projects you want to work with and go in there knowing that you have followed your dream. And that dream is completely attainable. And that is what I want to share with you that this has been my journey filled with barriers, but barriers that were completely removed because of a few good men, a few good people like Alan um, and my advisor and others in the field as I moved on, who have been truly mentors and anchors for me. And so good luck in your work. Thank you, everyone. I wish all of you the very best.